Good evening and welcome to uh, today's lecture, uh, Module 6. Uh, what I would like us to look at uh, today is um, uh, systems approaches for structural complexity. So, like we have been doing in the other modules, we will be able to look at what we mean by structural complexity first and then see uh, what are the different types of systems approaches for structural complexity. Uh, but as we have emphasized in other lectures, we will then focus the module on one aspect of structural complexity. And for this particular course or for this particular module, we will be looking at uh, systems, system dynamics. Now, system dynamics is a uh, very powerful methodology and also a computer simulation modeling technique for structuring, understanding, and discussing complex issues and problems. So as we have seen uh, from the other systems techniques that have been um, demonstrated in this particular course, uh, systems dynamics is also a systems thinking tool for uh, structuring uh, complex problems, uh, but the emphasis is different as we have seen in each of the other types of um, uh, systems thinking tools. Uh, in terms of history, uh, as we go on, we will see that, uh, you know, systems dynamics was developed uh, around the 1950s, uh, basically to help corporate managers improve their understanding of uh, the organizational processes. And we also know that systems dynamics is currently being used uh, very much in the public and the private sector, uh, particularly for policy analysis and, and policy design. So we'll see uh, what it is about and how relevant it is uh, for understanding complex problems. And we will see what type of complex problems uh, it is uh, relevant for. So in terms of uh, uh, the goals of this uh, module, um, I'd like us to, first of all, understand what structural complexity is, and then understand the meaning of what dynamics is uh, when we talk about a system. And then that will take us to looking at what systems dynamics modeling is, which will then follow uh, up with uh, a demonstration of how it has been used. And so the group exercise for this particular module will be based on how to apply systems dynamics, uh, you know, in understanding the complex problem uh, and the dilemmas that you have been looking at. And what we'll see that, what we'll see is that you will use system dynamics as a way of understanding an, an aspect of uh, the dilemma that you have uh, chosen as a group. So it is important that we understand what it is and how it is it has been applied. It is one of the most popular uh, systems approaches for structuring and understanding problems. As I've, as I've continued to emphasize before, that these tools that we are looking at uh, are meant to help in understanding problems. And in terms of management thinking, uh, understanding the structure of a problem uh, is really the first step to solving that problem. So let us not mistake the tools as ways of solving problems, but uh, they are tools for understanding the structure of problems so that uh, managers are able to uh, then uh, you know, devise a course of action in terms of how to solve those uh, specific problems. Now, I just want to go back a little bit in terms of revision uh, to look at the various uh, systems perspectives that we have looked at. Uh, because this is the last module, uh, it, it is useful, it's useful to look at what have we covered so far so that we understand uh, where those particular systems techniques that we have looked at 
uh, come in. And we started by looking at the, the machine perspective, uh, during which we looked at the systems engineering technique as a representative technique for um, you know, understanding problems from that machine perspective. So it is important to understand what is this machine perspective. I also highlighted that systems engineering is not the only uh, uh, you know, technique that is used from this machine perspective. There are other techniques you know, such as systems analysis and also operations research or management science. So those techniques fall under uh, the machine perspective of uh, systems thinking. And uh, as I had highlighted uh, earlier, uh, the machine perspective uh, looks at a problematical situation by focusing on the parts of the system and how those parts work together to achieve a desired outcome. Um, and, and therefore, it focuses on that problematical situation more like a machine. You know, uh, I gave examples such as how a car is designed, uh, how an aeroplane is designed, or even how software systems are designed from a machine perspective. And one of the key approaches in systems engineering is the systems, you know, the, the systems life cycle approach uh, that is used in the design of uh, software systems. Now, when we were looking at the module on systems engineering, uh, the emphasis of that machine approach uh, was basically to design for what we are calling sufficiency, or in quantitative terms, how to design systems uh, to be optimal by looking at how the functions of, of the various parts are contributing to of the mission of the particular, uh, you know, the, 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 the particular system. All right. So in its approach, the machine perspective, uh, the machine perspective seeks to identify the causes of faults. For example, in an existing uh, problem situation, or the perspective seeks to design a better system, uh, you know, to improve on a better system. Therefore, uh, the focus on optimization. So various techniques, uh, like if we talk about in operations research, that uh, if you pick a technique such as linear programming, uh, its whole idea is to focus on how to optimize, um, you know, uh, the, the, a particular objective, whether to uh, maximize profits or even to minimize costs for any particular situation. So. <clears throat> The, the nature of the machine perspective, therefore, involves identifying the system's aim and its causal connections and effects. And one of the things you did there was to look at the functional architecture of the system that you are designing. And if you recall, you had to focus first on the mission of that system and then, uh, you know, the lower level then focused on either the subsystems or the elements that are meant to address the mission of that particular system. And the lower level, uh, we considered that those parts focus on what are the function of those parts. Therefore, we ended up with a functional architecture uh, of a system. Now, the machine perspective has been, uh, you know, very instrumental in uh, disciplines such as engineering. And from a complexity perspective, uh, you know, we saw that it falls within the quadrant where in terms of a systems perspective, it is simple, while from a stakeholder perspective, uh, you know, the stakeholders are united in terms of what the mission of the system is. Therefore, it fell under the quadrant or the cell where the unitary and the simple aspects uh, interconnect. So that is where you find most of the uh, techniques such as systems engineering, operations research, uh, as well as systems, uh, systems analysis. And so that was the beginning in terms of looking at, at the machine perspective, which we also 
uh, uh, aligned to an older way of thinking, you know, the uh, machine perspective or reductionist approach to thinking, which was very prevalent uh, largely before the 1940s and 1950s. And therefore, we saw uh, ideas uh, related to the organismic perspective coming in, um, you know, since the late 1940s and 1950s, uh, when it was discovered that while the machine perspective was very functionally oriented, it was discovered that from an organismic perspective, living things such as human beings or even animals uh, cannot be treated as machines. And because living things or you know human beings have their own purposes that they want to pursue, whether it is within an organization or even within a family, you know, uh, you know, living things or human beings uh, want to pursue their own purposes. So the design of such systems uh, must consider that um, such living things uh, have their own purposes. And the purpose of most living things is to be able to thrive or to survive in their environment. Therefore, we introduced the technique of the viable systems model because the viable systems model uh, focuses on uh, how do organisms uh, and these organisms can either be people they can either be living things or they can even be organizations as organisms because organizations also want to be able to thrive in their environment and within that organization we'll find various stakeholders uh, who may want to pursue their own purposes. Uh, so, uh, uh, you know, therefore the logic was that you can't treat living things uh, as machines. And, 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 and therefore the approach that is adopted from an organ organismic perspective is quite different from uh, the machine perspective as, as, as we had seen. So you see, uh, you know, we, we demonstrated the role of the viable systems model. And we used it to understand uh, organizational complexity. And specifically, we use the viable systems model to structure organizations. How do you develop the structure of an organization so that it is able to thrive in the environment that it is operating in? Uh, so the organismic perspective or the organism perspective, therefore, focuses on system viability. In other words, the organism must maintain, must be able to maintain a dynamic equilibrium with the environment in order to survive and, and thrive. And I gave various, various examples. You know, uh, in, uh, if you look at an organization as an, uh, as an organism and, uh, you know, borrowing from uh, Stafford, St Stafford Beer, who came up with the viable systems model, uh, he he likened organizations to living organisms, therefore borrowing a lot from biology. And even how organizations are structured, uh, they borrow a lot from uh, that concept of the organization as uh, a living a living thing, right? So you, you, for instance, find that the head of an organization, the chief executive officer is the head of the organization. And, by likening, by likening the CEO as head, the head is a biological metaphor or a biological term. And even in the other functional areas, uh, the heads of those functional areas uh, are also using metaphors from biology, which focuses on, on, on living things. So uh, the head of marketing or the head of human capital, uh, focusing on human resources, again, uh, identifies or, or aligns with that thinking that you know organization is being looked at as a living uh, a living thing and therefore uh, the members of that living thing have their own purposes uh, which they need to pursue and therefore taking a mechanistic approach or a machine perspective uh, is, is has not been viable in terms of how organizations organizations operate. And, and even the, the meaning of the word cooperation, 
uh, meaning the farm or the organization. Uh, the corporation comes from uh, the word corpus, where corpus refers to the body. And again, a body is derived from, uh, you know, uh, the metaphor from biology, uh, which basically is the body of a human being or any living, any living thing. And the members, therefore, uh, uh, if you look at an organization from that perspective, from this systems thinking perspective, then uh, the focus is more on what is the purpose of the organization and also recognizing that the members of this body, the members of this organization may have their own purposes. Thus, organizations go to, to great lengths to try and align uh, the purposes of their various members to the, to the vision and mission of the organization. So even during interviews, when a new member needs to come in, the focus is, you know, uh, are the purposes of this new employee aligned to the purpose of the organization, recognizing that they may come in with their own purposes and, and, and the, in the interest of the organization, they want the purposes of all employees uh, to be aligned. So because of problems of misalignment or how employees are mistreated, we see historically how, for instance, the trade union movement uh, arose in organizations. The trade union movement basically arose to capture this aspect that organizational members can have their own purposes. Uh, and yet, how organizations were designed initially, organizations were designed as machines to be very efficient machines to do the purposes of the owner. So trade unionism is arising as a way of saying, you know, we also have our own purpose uh, in this organization. As an entrepreneur, you may have had your own vision, but you need uh, you need the employees, you need the uh, you know this, this this recruits that you are bringing in to help you in realizing your own vision. And therefore, you cannot treat them as a machine. And thus, the rise of trade unionism uh, to say that we cannot organize organizations as machines. And because when an organization is organized as a machine, the focus is on efficiency, which requires that the human beings are also treated in the manner machines are treated. They are just part of the resource, part of the five M's, of, you know, whether we talk about materials, money, men, methods that are used in the organization. So the organismic perspective was challenging this thinking of the machine perspective to say that members in terms of the living, um, you know, the human beings as, as living things may have their own purposes. Thus, we saw the rise of uh, trade unionism in organizations till to date. Right? So this is the perspective uh, that we actually emphasize uh, in terms of the uh, uh, the organismic or the organism perspective from a systems perspective, uh, you know, in terms of the systems view. Uh, again, then we then moved on to uh, what I characterize as the the cultural stroke political perspective of the systems view. Uh, under this systems view. Uh, the representative technique that we looked at was soft systems methodology. And, and we saw that soft systems methodology uh, is a technique for addressing people, complex, uh, people complexity, right? So again, here we are now moving uh, uh, to the level of people because within those organizations, we have uh, a diversity of people. And... Uh, you know, people have uh, come from various cultural orientations. And I emphasize the idea that, uh, you know, when you are talking about culture, uh, you are all, you are touching on belief systems of people, how they have been brought up, not only as individuals, but these individuals uh, belong to families uh, that shape these individuals that work in these organizations. Now, these families fit within a broader community. This community then uh, fits within a broader society 
and eventually a nation or a state. So the cultural political perspective uh, tries to identify that people are of diverse worldviews and those diverse worldviews influence how they work or even how their understanding of problems. So we saw that soft systems methodology was useful for bringing out these worldviews so that in any team effort, and an organization obviously would be sort of a team effort, uh, that understanding of different worldviews uh, can aid in uh, moving towards a consensus uh, in understanding how a problem is unfolding. So that's why, um, you know, in this slide that you see in front of you, we talk about the cultural political perspective as focused on what is called inscribed cultural knowledge. In other words, what is the dominant cultural stroke political representation that you find in how systems are designed? Uh, uh, you know, so that, that definitely is part of even how we design products or services. And I gave, uh, I gave earlier examples of how when you think about a digital dilemma such as, uh, such as uh, you know, the digital platforms and how they are being designed. I gave the example of Uber and share, uh, you know, Airbnb as uh, the accommodation platform. You find that the way those uh, digital platforms are designed are based on a certain type of worldview. Uh, I, I gave uh, an example such as the use of uh, uh, rentier capitalism. In other words, is based on the concept of rent, which is linked to uh, capitalistic thinking, which there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, uh, so, but that 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 idea then comes through in terms of how the the product is designed, uh, which influences, you know, how value is extracted from such systems. So that is a worldview on how those particular digital platforms are designed. And as we, as, as we had seen, uh, that is linked to uh, the cultural practices of those individuals uh, that are designing those systems. So we recognize, I think the cultural and political perspective just recognizes that we come from different worldviews and those worldviews will have a bearing on how we understand problems. So part of the soft systems methodology approach is how can you uh, um, you know, move towards consensus uh, given the different worldviews uh, that the different individuals have. So, because those different worldviews will then influence how you transform, uh, how you carry out the transformation process, because the transformation process is where now you intervene to be able to address the problem that you want to understand or the problem that you want to structure. So that was the, import, uh, the importance of the soft systems methodology uh, when we're looking at it. Now, the other systems uh, view that we looked at was focused on uh, the societal stroke environmental view. So when we were looking at uh, the critical systems heuristics. The critical systems heuristics was actually aligned to this systems perspective, which is focused on uh, the societal stroke environmental perspective. The idea behind it is that in society, the way people use power, uh, you know, is seen in various ways. So, for instance, if we look at um, aspects such as the digital divide or other, you know, uh, you know, dilemmas that we see in society. Uh, those uh, speak to how power has been expressed in society. And so the societal stroke environmental perspective uh, helps us to understand, uh, for instance, why there is inequality in the world. Uh, now, obviously, the reason why there is inequality in the world 
yeah, is based on how certain powerful segments of the society have used coercive power to be able to gain advantage uh, in society. So uh, it is therefore linked, uh, you know, it's actually uh, building up on the cultural political dominance of certain groups and how they express their power by using coercion. So now we are not talking about consensus building. We are, we are saying that, you know, there are certain segments of society uh, that have an advantage in terms of the power that they have. They then use that to their advantage to, to create systems uh, that benefit them. And I gave examples such as, you know, processes of colonization that happened in the past. Uh, you know, we talk about, uh, for instance, pra practices that we see related to, uh, you know, slavery or even apartheid itself. Those are um, aspects that emphasize that uh, power can be used coercively uh, to the advantage of certain segments of the population. Now, when you talk about a critical systems heuristic, when you talk about critical system heuristics technique, it then helps us to understand how coercive power is being used in society but particularly to identify those who are disadvantaged. So from a systems perspective, the emphasis is to understand how discrimination is happening in society and so that, uh, you know, those who are being discriminated against uh, can be emancipated or, uh, you know, uh, that, that, that discrimination can be addressed. So when we talk about uh, issues such as the digital divide, uh, then these such techniques are meant to help in understanding why the di digital divide is proceeding the way it is proceeding. And, there is, uh, and the, the importance for understanding why uh, it is proceeding the way it is proceeding is so that uh, the problem can be solved. If you don't understand the nature of discrimination, uh, in society, it may not be possible to solve some of these, uh, you know, um, um, expressions of coercive power uh, that appears in our society or in our, in our environment. So the societal stroke environmental perspective in terms of the system's view uh, tries, tries to foster understanding of discrimination and inequality particularly in the context of neglected stakeholders. So it is in this light that you need to see the importance of techniques such as critical system heuristics. So that, is the, that was the emphasis for that particular module uh, that, that we, did, uh, we did earlier. And then lastly, for this particular course, we will be looking at uh, the last systems view which is focused on the interrelationship perspective. And for, this partic for that particular view, we will look at the system dynamics uh, technique. Now, the understanding you need to get from the interrelationship perspective of the systems view is that it is a lens of systems thinking which can be a very effective tool for understanding the structure of causal linkages of systems. The basic idea is this, that, you know, in, in our society, uh, there is interdependence. We depend on each other as human beings. We depend, organizations depend on each other for resources, um, ETC, how we behave. Uh, the nature of interactions, the nature of interactions determine system behavior, right? So uh, it is difficult uh, in, in, in the current world to be able to, to for example, live alone. Uh, you depend on resources that are being made by somebody else, and that somebody else depend on resources or even services that are coming from somebody else ETC. So the interrelationship perspective em emphasizes, uh, you know, interactions uh, between various systems, subsystems, and 
the subsystem elements. Uh, so the emphasis of the techniques that you find uh, which have uh, an interrelationship focus is to understand the structure of behavior of systems. And that's why the focus talks about how to structure causal linkages of uh, various uh, systems, right? So, uh, and its foundation is that all issues, all, you know, all issues related to the problems or even the dilemmas that you are focused on, uh, you know, that you have identified are in, interconnected in particular chains. And those chains of reciprocal causation, uh, but which suggests that there could be unintended consequences, uh, you know, uh, which, which, which imply that there's need for improving the design of such systems. Uh, for example, when you talk about uh, the design of the original internet. It was meant for communication. I mean, the designers, the designers of the internet um, uh, wanted to solve the problem of communication. And therefore, uh, that was the, the whole idea. Now, how do we communicate better between one scientist to the other? Or in the military, how do we enhance communication? And then it was now extended to, uh, you know, how individuals communicate not not, not not necessarily in in research or military terms but also in personal relationships therefore the rise of electronic mail or email can be linked to the desire of the designers to uh, improve communication however the unintended consequence of uh, you know designing such a system we have seen the rise of electronic commerce or e-commerce or even digital business. Uh, that was not the initial design. That was an unintended consequence. Uh, you know, various sectors of the digital economy as a reason, as an unintended consequence. So as the nature of interrelationship between the components of the internet system started being understood, uh, it was seen that uh, there are other aspects of behavior of that system which have unintended consequences, uh, which were not seen prior, uh, uh, or even in the plan of the of the designers. So, when we talk about um, techniques such as systems dynamics, they help us to understand the behavior of such problematical situations where the focus is on how how do the different elements interact with each other. So if you take a problem, you want to understand what are the factors that are influencing why it is successful or why it is problematic. Now, the focus of the structural perspective of systems dynamics is to see how those various factors link to each other. Which factor causes this one or which factor is correlated to another factor and, and, and vice versa. So the emphasis of this particular course, uh, uh, sorry, of this particular module is on looking at systems dynamics as a systems thinking technique for understanding the interrelationship between various systems, subsystems, or even elements of a particular system by focusing on the problematical situation. So that's why we talk about, uh, you know, the focus is on structuring of systems. Um, I've given you a reference of a paper that I wrote that can that gives you a summary of uh, how these systems views are linked to uh, various techniques which you can have a look at. All right, let us now uh, proceed to focus on, uh, you know, uh, this module's um, uh, focus, which is looking at these systems approaches to structural complexity. And as I've indicated, we will specifically focus on system dynamics. Um, I am starting with a quote from Peter Senger, who in 1990 uh, wrote the book uh, the fifth discipline, and 
the book that Peter Senge wrote uh, in 1990 became you know, almost an immediate hit, uh, particularly in management circles. Um, um, when he, so you would actually say that he actually brought systems thinking uh, to the domain of uh, professionals in terms of management. Um, and what Peter Senge says is that systems thinking is a discipline for seeing the structures that underlie complex situations and for discerning high from low leverage change. Ultimately, he continues, it simplifies life by helping us to see the deeper patterns lying beneath the events and the details. And, and just from this quote, if you recall, I had shown you the iceberg model. And from the iceberg model, we saw that above, above the sea, there were events, which are things that are happening, things that we can see, things that we can observe uh, using our senses. Those are events. Now, sometimes events may appear to be random. Uh, to, the, to the human eye or to the observer, uh, that is how it may appear like. However, below the surface, below the sea, if you, if you recall what the iceberg model was about, uh, those seemingly unconnected events are uh, actually connected in certain structures. Those structures that, that are beneath the surface of uh, the sea, from the iceberg model's perspective, uh, form particular patterns. It is these patterns that lie beneath the events uh, that we call structures. And so Peter Senge was basically saying, what we see as events is not the whole picture. And if you go beneath the surface, uh, then you start seeing connections between those, 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 those particular events. So when you start uh, looking at uh, you know new disciplines that are related to uh, data science, such as data mining, that 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 looks at data, data as representing events, uh, to to start forming patterns by mining how those various data points are connected to each other, then you can start seeing uh, the meaning of structures as implied by Peter Senge's quote that. Uh, what you see as events actually points to certain underlying structures, things beneath the surface that are not obvious. But, you know, if you reflect more on what those events are, actually point to certain, uh, certain underlying structures. So this was the idea of Peter Senge. And he then go, went on to say in the fifth discipline, that actually organizations are learning organizations. For an organization to survive in its environment, uh, those events that happen, uh, we need to focus more on what, how are those events interconnected? How are they interrelated? What is the nature of interactions between those events which points to a particular pattern of behavior or structure of behavior, which is not visible, you know, uh, you know, from the naked eye or by observation. So that's why I'm giving the example of, you know, if we talk about uh, some aspects of machine learning or data mining, uh, that very process of machine learning is interested in identifying those underlying structures or patterns that are not obvious. So we talk about those disciplines uh, coming up with insights, uh, but those insights are related to the structure or behavior of the system as represented in, uh, in the data. So the quotation that you see from Peter Senge is uh, simply to emphasize that um, the structural aspect of complexity that we talk about uh, is not obvious. That, therefore, from a systems perspective, if you look at the the diagram that I am showing in, uh, that, that that is in front of you, from a systems perspective, it is complicated because it is not obvious what is the nature of the interactions 
therefore, the technique tries to the techniques that are used for understanding uh, how complicated uh, they are tries to determine what is the nature of those interactions. Though, from a systems perspective, uh, it is recognized that those systems, no, sorry, the approach recognizes that the stakeholders are unitary in terms of their understanding of the problem and what they want to achieve. Right? So the stakeholders have consensus. We want to be able to address this problem, right? But we don't understand the nature of the interactions. Um, and that's why on this diagram, it is indicated from a systems perspective that it is complicated. And uh, we have talked about, uh, you know, the meanings of uh, the axis from the stakeholder perspective and the systems perspective. So for this particular aspect that we, as we introduce uh, this idea of structural complexity, uh, we need to remember that structural complexity arises from the arrangement of and dynamic interrelationships between the many elements that make up a complicated system. That is what we end up by in terms of uh, uh, summary of what we are talking about at this and that when you think about the word dynamic it is actually opposite to what we call static because static implies stationary or from a, a research perspective cross-sectional dynamic implies that you need to look at the nature of the interactions or the nature of the behavior over time. So while static implies looking at the behavior at a single point in time, the meaning of dynamic, as we see it here, is that you look at the behavior of a particular system over time. So it's difficult from a dynamic, from a structural complexity perspective to understand such systems by looking at it at a single point in time. You look at the nature of the behavior of the system over time so that you understand uh, its, uh, its behavior. So in, 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 in quantitative terms then, dynamic actually implies looking at the non-linear behavior of a system, not a linear behavior of a system, non-linear behavior of uh, uh, of, of, of a system. That's the implication of uh, what the word dynamic means as used in, for instance, uh, you know, dynamic, uh, dynamic uh, uh, system dynamics. Uh, so, <clears throat> so the system, the systems methodology that has this as its main area of concern is system dynamics. So it is basically an approach for thinking about and also simulating situations uh, and organizations of all kinds and, si and sizes by visualizing how the elements fit together and how they interact and how they change over time. Because we, dynamism, I mean, for you to understand dynamism, you must understand the behavior of a system uh, over time, not at a single point in time. Uh, that is the implication of dynamism. Otherwise, that, uh, when you talk about static, it is at a single point in, in time. So as we look at uh, what system dynamics is, we must understand that behavior can only be understood. Behavior of systems and not just systems, even behavior of human beings, uh, behavior of families, behavior of communities, behavior of a society uh, can only be understood uh, over time um, so that you are able to understand the kind of problems that are expressing themselves within that particular family, within that particular community, ETC, or within that particular organization. Uh, that then allows for a better intervention if you are able to understand, um, you know, how the problem exhibits itself over time. A single point in time may not give the complete picture. So 
of dynamism implies, look at that problem, how is it exhibiting itself over time? And, and so uh, that's why when you talk about uh, using techniques such as simulation in uh, system dynamics, simulation basically tries to capture the various variables that are associated with that problem and how those variables are changing over time. So if it is an organization and uh, the you know sales have been declining, you can only understand the reasons why sales have been declining if you study the component of sales and the behavior of that decline over time. A single day, by focusing on a single day, uh, you know, depending on uh, the aspect you're looking at, may not be enough to understand why are sales declining. It may be important, it may be useful depending on the product or the service or the organization to look at what is the behavior of this particular variable we are calling sales over a number of days, over a number of months, or possibly over a number of years, depending on uh, the, you know, uh, the, the kind of product that the organization is, is looking at. Or even if you consider other organizational variables uh, such as profit, uh, the behavior, uh, you know, the nature of profitability can only be understood from a systems perspect uh, perspective by looking at how, what is the nature of profits over time? You know, there are many organizations that made a lot of profit during the COVID period. Now, beyond COVID, is profitability going to be the same? So if uh, decisions are being made based on how profits were, were during COVID, it doesn't give the entire picture in terms of whether the business model of the organization was right or not. So that it is important to look at those variables, those factors over time in order to understand what is actually the correct system state so that you understand the behavior of the system. So we talk about system state by looking at the behavior of those variables over time. Right. Okay, this, this next slide on event-oriented thinking, uh, I use it to try and um, clarify further the difference between linear and non-linear thinking. So linear thinking uh, is typical of looking at a problem as an event and then determining a solution as a fix. So uh, this is not the type of thinking that is linked to the system dynamics approach systems dynamics approach is focused more on a nonlinear uh, uh, mode of thinking. So uh, what I'm emphasizing here and borrowing from Reynolds and Holwell uh, is that there are two contrasting thinking perspectives uh, that people use to, uh, to, you know, in any particular problematical situation. Uh, so the the, the, the one which is very predominant, which is not linked to systems thinking, is the event-oriented approach. And then the one that is linked to systems thinking is the feedback or the joined-up approach that actually is the foundation of systems dynamics. Uh, so in many ways, they're actually uh, polar opposites of each other. Uh, the event-oriented approach is much more linear, uh, while the feedback approach uh, is linked to uh, the system's uh, perspective. Uh, yes, we do know that, you know, from a pragmatic or even from a practical perspective, the event-oriented thinking as shown uh, is typically how we think about, in many ways, how we think about problems. That, you know, we identify the problem, then you go about uh, gathering data, 
that is relevant for you to solve that particular problem. You then identify the uh, alternatives that are available for you to solve that problem. So we talk about evaluating alternatives, selecting a solution, and then implementing uh, the solution that you have determined to be feasible for that particular problem. So this is it's a very common way of thinking and it's very, uh, uh, you know, it's very mechanistic. We saw the systems life cycle, which, uh, you know, almost is uh, aligned to this type of thinking. So when you, when you think about the traditional systems development life cycle of information systems, it, it almost aligns to this. And then uh, with the incorporation of systems thinking, it was realized uh, it needs to be changed in a particular way. So systems engineering then emerged to look at uh, this process in a different manner, as we had seen uh, in, a, in a previous module. So yes, we know that event-oriented thinking is widespread and is actually very compelling. It looks pragmatic and action-oriented, and it can lead to swift and uh, definitely decisive action. Uh, you know, but there are limitations to this uh, approach, uh, and, uh, and 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 the key limitation uh, that has been identified from a systems thinking perspective is that we don't see where feedback comes in. That in 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 solving any problem or trying to understand any problem and solving that problem, what is the role of feedback? Uh, that that can inform uh, thinking to improve the decision making process. Uh, this is not clear from uh, an or uh, you know an event oriented thinking perspective, which is very uh, linear uh, in nature. Right. So uh, this is why when you talk about uh, the, the the feedback oriented approach, it then tries to incorporate. Uh, you know, feedback into the, uh, the process of decision making when understanding a problem and coming up with a solution to, uh, to that particular problem. So what you see in front of you, uh, therefore, emphasizes this very common uh, pragmatic uh, action-oriented approach, which can be, can be very useful when you are firefighting, you need to make decisions quickly but sometimes, but will not give you a full picture of what the structure of the problem is. Yes, when you look at a problem as an event, uh, your goal is to be able to solve that problem. So you have your goal to solve the problem. Uh, you look at the problematical situation. Uh, if your desired goal uh, and the situation, there is a gap. Uh, that's why we talk about a discrepancy. Uh, so you make a decision in order to, um, um, you know, uh, realize a certain results when you take action. So basically, your solution is a fix to that particular problem from a, an event-oriented perspective. So it outlines a very linear process of uh, decision making, uh, and. Uh, and, and the idea behind a linear process is that for any two elements in that particular situation, the assumption is that there is a constant proportion between the cause and effect. And, and that's why it can be drawn in a straight line. So, um, for instance, we talk about linear programming. It can be drawn in a straight line. Uh, so... The effect is actually what is referred to as an additive. There's a constant proportion between cause and effect. So if, uh, for instance, you uh, the input was, 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 was uh, you know, two, um, the proportional effect is likely to be two as well, right? So it is additive in nature. And yet we know sometimes that is not the case in reality. Uh, the input may be one, but the effect may be more than that. Uh, and that's why uh, non-linear relationships then start coming into play. So using the example that I'd, I'd given of 
what the designers of the internet intended. So they, de they designed uh, a network for to enhance communication. But the effects of that network that they designed had many, many things, many unintended consequences. So it was no longer linear in nature. So a relationship between any two elements, when we talk about a non-linear relationship, uh, uh, does not necessarily produce a proportional effect, but can produce a non-proportional effect. Uh, so uh, I, I am sure that you know some of the designers of the internet were, uh, were were surprised that you know we we designed it to be a communication system, but now people are using it for e-commerce, e-government. They had even, you know, negative unintended consequences to society. Uh, when you talk about, uh, you know, uh, crime related to uh, terrorism, when terrorists use the internet, uh, uh, that, that was not the intention of the designers. Or when you talk about pornography on the internet, those are unintended consequences of, 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 of uh, the design of the internet. That is the nature of non-linear relationships, so that uh, the intention in terms of the design uh, then becomes something else because the nature of the relationship be between the two elements can produce a certain effect which is not necessarily <coughs> uh, you know, linear, but non-linear in terms of the proportionality associated with the interactions between the elements of the system. We now know what elements are, so when they interact with each other, they can pro uh, produce from a non-linear perspective uh, non-proportional effects. It is this non-proportionality in terms of relationships uh, that is the focus of a dynamic system perspective. So systems dynamics then uh, is basically telling us uh, the interactions of factors within a particular problem can have unintended consequences and that we should be able to understand that problematical situations that are both that are complicated uh, who can behave this way uh, the non-linear nature of how the various factors interact uh, with with each other this is the emphasis here that as we talk about uh, the dynamic systems perspective, we are moving beyond event-oriented thinking, which is linear in nature, making an assumption that the nature of cause and effect are linear or proportional in nature, but rather uh, the nature of cause and effect in terms of the interactions of any system element uh, can be uh, non-linear in nature. And thus the techniques are focused on understanding such problems uh, where we are likely to see such behavior. So this next slide that you see in front of you uh, basically emphasizes that event-oriented thinking uh, by giving a number of examples. Uh, uh, for instance, uh, one of the social problems that some of the social problems that we see in society as events is uh, unruly binge dr drinkers. You know, uh, obviously, if they are unruly drinkers, uh, you know, they are likely to cause, for instance, ac accidents on the roads, etc. So, what you find uh, society is doing is to deploy more police so that they can police those who are, uh, would be misbehaving on the roads uh, after after drinking, right? So unruly binge drinking is therefore linked to the solution of deploying more police. Or if you talk about drug-related crimes, again, we see uh, societies responding by putting more police to be able to try and solve that problem. Or if you talk about traffic congestion on the roads, uh, again, societies uh, such as countries and states react by building more roads to try and address uh, those uh, solutions, uh, sorry, those problems that are being viewed 
as, as events, right? So this is the uh, aspect of event-oriented thinking that uh, we would like to contrast with, um, uh, you know, the feedback thinking uh, that is emphasized from a dynamic systems uh, perspective. Uh, so we know that over time, if you look at these solutions, in any society in the world, uh, you know, experience suggests that in the long run, all these problems that you see in front of you, if you talk about traffic congestion, however number of uh, roads you build, yes, within a short, uh, you know, in the medium and the short term, traffic congestion may, I mean, building new roads may ease traffic congestion. But experience has shown that there are other unintended consequences of uh, the building of those new roads uh, and traffic congestion then just returns. So experience has shown that in the long run, these problems have never been solved by deploying more police, if you're talking about unruly binge, dr uh, binge drinkers or drug-related crimes. Uh, the whole world is still uh, struggling with the, uh, you know, the problem of uh, drugs in society and more and more police are being deployed. And of course, we see traffic congestion in major cities that have very, very good infrastructure, uh, whether you talk about, uh, you know, cities in the West, in Europe, in Africa, you talk about uh, big cities such as Lagos struggling with traffic congestion but with very, generally very good infrastructure. Uh, whether you talk about cities in South Africa, such as Johannesburg, or even uh, other countries such as uh, Kenya, uh, in Nairobi has generally very good road infrastructure. But congestion continues, even though uh, roads are being built. Uh, and so uh, that aspect of un unintended consequences point to uh, a certain feedback system that is not understood from event-oriented thinking that uh, hopefully we'll be able to uncover when we approach problems from a dynamic systems perspective. So uh, this slide basically emphasizes the thinking that, uh, you know, apart from contrasting event-oriented thinking from system, systems thinking based on the feedback approach, it emphasizes that the, a feedback approach is different from event-oriented thinking because it strives to, it strives for solutions that are you know, in a way, sympathetic with the environment, whether it is an organizational environment or a, or a social environment. And so the understanding from um, a feedback sy uh, systems thinking perspective is that problems do not just stem from events and solutions are not implemented in a, in a vacuum, you know, in that linear manner where if, if A causes uh, C, uh, that's what, what is expected. No. Uh, there, there may be other influences uh, that affect that relationship, uh, which requires that we understand feedback thinking. Therefore, uh, feedback thinking uh, instead emphasizes that problems and solutions coexist and are interdependent. So the emphasis of the interrelationship perspective of uh, the system's view is that interdependence. Uh, that is the emphasis. And there is a long history to these ideas. And as I've highlighted before, uh, you know, uh, Peter Senge brought these ideas to light in his very influential book in 1990. Uh, that is called the, the fifth display, which, uh, you know, uh, I would encourage uh, you to have a look at to understand ideas that, uh, that are related to this interdependency of systems, the interaction of systems, 
the interrelationship perspective from a systems view that has uh, now been recognized as very critical in understanding uh, how systems behave over time and, and, and how systems behave over time point us to the structure of those systems. So in further uh, differentiating between event-oriented uh, versus uh, feedback systems thinking, uh, the slide you see in front of you, uh, borrowing from the source that you see below, uh, uses an example that is, uh, you know, many people can relate to, which is traffic congestion in any country. Um, so if you if you take it from an event-oriented perspective, um, the problem of traffic congestion can be solved by basically uh, building new roads. Uh, so it's sort of a linear approach, and we have highlighted this approach. So linear event-oriented representation, but there is really no feedback to, to that kind of process or decision-making. So you have noticed the problem of traffic congestion. Uh, the solution is, or the fix is, let us build a new road. Now, but if the same problem is represented in a dynamic uh, perspective. So the second uh, diagram that you see below um, the linear approach, uh, we, we are saying it is a dynamic representation, including some form of, some form of delay. Because uh, if you've noticed the problem as traffic congestion, and the decision is, or the policy is, let us build a new road. Surely it will take some time to complete the building of that road. So in any decision or in many decisions, there is always a delay in terms of seeing the effect of that decision. So what is represented in that diagram is that, yes, there is traffic congestion and traffic congestion can be solved by building a new road. So. When you see um, the arrow below, it shows that, uh, you know, traffic congestion um, results in a policy change in terms of building a new road. But for that new road to reduce traffic congestion shown on the, the upper arrow, uh, it is also shown that there is a delay shown by those two parallel lines. Now, obviously, when, when there is a delay, it means that the traffic congestion problem continues. All right, so the second diagram simply captures that when you start thinking in a feedback manner, then any new policy in terms of a decision, such as building a new road, you are recognizing that time element that that decision that you're making is likely to, uh, there's that delay that is uh, going to impact, uh, uh, you know, the solving of that particular problem. All right, so that is highlighted in uh, the second diagram, uh, and then, uh, which is further expanded as, you exp as we expand the idea of feedback thinking that, uh, again, if we talk about traffic congestion, it doesn't happen out of nowhere. Uh, therefore, if you see on the on the left side, we have traffic congestion can only happen if the number of cars increase on the roads. The number of cars again can increase based on some other cause. Maybe people have more money to buy cars, etc. So that's why there are more cars on the road. It could be just one reason why there are more cars on the road and therefore that causes traffic congestion and that that puts pressure on uh, on stakeholders or in terms of policy makers that we need to construct more roads uh, so that we can reduce traffic congestion uh, but we also notice from that line um, um, in the second diagram that there will be a delay 
in solving that problem because a road takes time to construct. Uh, you don't just notice there's traffic congestion. That's why we said it's not a static problem. It's a dynamic problem based on time. And when time is involved, uh, some of the policy decisions, uh, therefore, are subject to delays. Um, so it takes time to construct a road. So by the time that problem is solved, there is delay as represented by these two uh, parallel lines. And we will introduce, con I mean, what you see in the middle of this uh, feedback, the feedback approach, uh, such as B, referring to uh, a balancing feedback loop, uh, and R referring to a reinforcing feedback loop, loop we'll come back, uh, back to them uh, later. But in the third diagram, you also see as a result of introducing another cause as part of the problematical situation, we have introduced another cause in terms of the number of cars. If the number of cars, uh, the, as the number of cars in, increase, when you construct a new road, uh, what do you think is going to happen? The likely effect that we'll have is that there will be more cars on the road. So a new road construction can actually result in more cars getting onto the road because some of those people who are not using their cars and were using uh, you know, the public transport, uh, transport system may say, okay, so now there's less traffic on the roads, I can now use my car. I don't have to use the bus or the train anymore. So the unintended consequence of constructing a new road is to increase the number of cars, which obviously is going to increase traffic congestion. This is what the third diagram is, is implying. So when you talk about feedback systems thinking, it starts to expose those unintended consequences which would not have been obvious if you think in a linear manner. Traffic congestion, let us construct a new road is going to solve that problem. But as these uh, two following diagrams have shown, that is unlikely to be the outcome. Uh, so as you build new roads, you're likely to have more cars on the road uh, uh, and therefore uh, make the problem worse. So are you going to build more roads? Are you not going to end up with, you know, uh, uh, exacerbating the problem uh, much, much more? So as you start uh, transitioning to a feedback uh, systems view, then it is important to introduce the concept of a uh, balancing loop and, uh, you know, a reinforcing loop. So in terms of the meaning of what the, uh, the B and the R is in terms of the feedback loops, uh, this is what I would like to explain now. But uh, first, uh, as we move into what feedback systems thinking is, uh, feedback basically means uh, giving people or the decision makers quick, accurate, and emphatic information about the results of their actions. Uh, so that is basically the meaning. So when we talk about a balancing feedback loop, as is illustrated in uh, the second uh, diagram here, uh, here we have traffic congestion as the problem. And to solve this problem, we build a new road. So it is expected that that will solve the problem. So from an event-oriented perspective, but from a feedback, uh, uh, you know, systems thinking perspective, we know that building the road has a delay component. So that has to be communicated. That how long is the delay? In other words, traffic congestion will happen for some period of time. Yes, we know that when you build the road 
it will eventually uh, result in reduction of traffic congestion. So when we talk about a balancing uh, feedback loop, loop uh, what it means that it has a stabilizing uh, uh, effect. So it is a stabilizing, goal-seeking or regulating feedback loop. It is also known as a negative feedback loop because it opposes or reverses whatever direction of change is imposed on the system. So we know that traffic congestion, for instance, is bad in society. When you build a road, Traffic congestion results in the decision, therefore positive. It results in, let us build new roads. So it results in an increase in the number of roads that are being constructed. When the number of roads increases, uh, the overall effect, despite the delay, is to reduce traffic congestion. That is why there's a negative uh, polarity here. So on the lower arrow, there is a positive direction. In other words, indicating that because of this problem, it results in an increase in the number of roads, while above the, the, the effect it will have is um, an, a, you know, a decrease in traffic congestion. So the causation is like this, that traffic congestion causes an increase in new road constructions. But in terms of feedback, the effect is that there is a reduction in traffic congestion. So the cause and effect relationship is established. So when we talk about a balancing feedback loop, it therefore um, uh, opposes or reverses the direction of change in terms of that cause and effect relationship. So on one side, in terms of the causal, if in terms of the cause, it is increasing road construction. Uh, on the opposite side, or on the reverse side, in terms of feedback, um, it is causing a decrease in traffic congestion, and therefore. The, the positive and the negative balance each other or cancel each other. So it is therefore also referred to as a balancing feedback loop or a negative uh, feedback loop. So that's the meaning of the B yeah, in, in, in these diagrams that you see uh, that are also known as uh, causal loop diagrams as we'll see later on. So whenever you see a B, that is the implication because uh, the cause uh, traffic congestion, for instance, in the third diagram, again, that's the implication. It's the same diagram that you see here. It's just that there's an added feedback, especially if you bring another cause that the number of cars is actually what causes an increase in traffic congestion. Right? So if there's an increase in the number of cars, uh, traffic congestion increases, causes uh, uh, a decision to be made to build new roads. But that also has an effect of increasing the number of cars. As the number, I gave an explanation as, as the number of, uh, due to these new road constructions, those who are not using their cars will now put their cars on the road. They will leave the public transport system. And therefore, that will cause an increase in the number of cars on the roads. So if you look at the outer feedback system, uh, it is both positive, number of cars causing an increase in traffic congestion, which results in decisions in terms of policy to build new roads. Building new roads, though there's a delay, will actually cause an increase in the number of cars on the road. So for that particular circle, it is referred to as reinforcing. Therefore, the outer circle is a reinforcing um, a feedback loop. Therefore, a reinforcing feedback loop 
amplifies or enhances the feedback loop. It is also known as a positive feedback loop because it reinforces the direction of change. And at the end of the day, both of them, you know, they, 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 they demonstrate a vicious cycle. So it doesn't matter the number of new roads that you construct. There will be more cars on the roads. There will be traffic congestion, etc. So, but this information is only coming from looking at the same problem uh, from a feedback perspective, not from an event-oriented perspective. The event-oriented perspective could imply that this, you know, that problem will be solved. Uh, but as we start looking at the feedback approach, it starts telling you that it actually ends up being a vicious cycle. Uh, as you build more roads, there are more cars on the on the roads, and you will continue building new roads, etc. And the vicious cycle uh, continues. So uh, the reinforcing feedback loop system therefore amplifies or enhances the feedback loop, and therefore. It reinforces the direction of change. It becomes a vicious cycle or even a virtuous cycle. If it is positive to society, it is virtuous. If it is something that is negative to society, then it is a vicious cycle. Uh, so the intent in terms of systems thinking is to be able to approach what is known as a dynamic equilibrium. Yeah, so uh, therefore, the reason for, for instance, systems dynamics. Uh, how do you approach a dynamic equilibrium? And the dynamic equilibrium is basically a condition in which uh, the state of the system is steady and unchanging despite the inflows or the outflows. So uh, if you talk about the, rate, the, the road network, you want uh, that system to be steady where, for instance, there's no traffic congestion or where there's no pressure to build more roads because you have arrived, I mean, there's that dynamic equilibrium. Uh, so uh, it is, it is uh, you know, theoretically this is uh, indicated that this is only possible if the inflows and the outflows are actually equal to each other. Are actually equal. So in system dynamics, the reason for using simulation is to be able to determine what is the dynamic equilibrium level now, so that you don't end up in a, either a vicious cycle or a virtuous cycle because both of them have unintended consequences that are sometimes uh, difficult to control. This slides, what, in this slide, what you see is an expanded version of uh, the same traffic problem. Um, so just recognizing that there are other factors that are involved uh, when we're talking about uh, the traffic situation. Uh, so I've talked about uh, the meaning of uh, what a balancing uh, feedback loop is and what a reinforcing feedback loop is. In this expanded version of uh, this traffic problem, uh, then you see a number of them. Uh, so we have classified them or named them as B1, B2, B3, B4, etc. Uh, showing that there are different uh, feedback loops. So if you consider this particular figure, it is basically capturing in an expanded format. Uh, uh, you know, uh, what what you call a causal cause loop diagram uh, that tries to look at the factors that contribute to, you know, road use and traffic congestion. And, and uh, uh, this, this diagram is picked from Sturman, who talks about system di di dynamics. Now, if, if, you, if you think about, uh, if you look at this diagram, and maybe I focus on the, the, the first loop, which is the B1. 
and the B1 uh, and what, what is normal to do when you are creating uh, these feedback systems. So this is an example of a causal loop diagram is uh, for you to name you might, uh, uh, the, 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 the feedback loops should be named. So the first one that you see on top here, the B1 is uh, being named as capacity expansion. And, and so um, you can look at what, what are the factors that are important in understanding capacity expansion as it relates to uh, traffic congestion. And what you see here, for example, is that highway capacity, you know, any road capacity um, can reduce travel time. So if you move counterclockwise, we have highway capacity. In other words, the more lanes, the more road lanes you have on a particular highway uh, can reduce travel time. That's why there's a negative polarity here. So highway capacity reduces travel time. If travel time is reduced, then the effect it will have is to reduce pressure. Pressure to reduce congestion actually um, you know, increases. That's the, that's the point. Pressure to reduce congestion. Because there are more highway la uh, lanes, travel time is reduced, then pressure to reduce congestion actually increases. And if, sorry, pressure to reduce congestion, yes, reduces. And that may have an impact of more roads being constructed. So with increased um, travel time, the important point to note here if there is a reduced travel time, it means that there will be more people wanting to use the roads because they see, you know, it is good to use my car. I don't need to use the public transport system anymore. That's why the, the effect of this is for more road construction because reduced travel time implies there are more cars on the road. If there's more road construction, as I'd explained, there's a delay component before those roads uh, then have an impact at the end of the day. So B1, therefore, is, uh, you know, one of the feedback loops that can be used to understand uh, the nature of uh, traffic congestion. And there are other feedback loops as, as, been, as is being shown in this particular, in this particular diagram. Now, so if you if if we focus on the cause and effect links that depict the far-reaching interdependencies between highway capacity and traffic volume, um, So what is implied in this uh, B1, uh, the, the, the loop focusing on capacity expansion, uh, shows that as motorists experience an increase, uh, basically in travel time relative to desired travel time, the amount of time they are willing to spend on travel, there is growing pressure on planners to reduce congestion. And that's why we talk about an increase in road construction. All right, so uh, therefore this pressure leads to road construction, which after time, which after time delay of maybe uh, several weeks or months, depending on how long the road takes, results in more highway capacity. And therefore more highway capacity reduces travel time as motorists are able, as motorists are able to reach their destinations more quickly on less crowded uh, roads. Uh, so these these four links that you see 
in P1. Um, make a closed feedback loop labeled uh, capacity expansion. Uh, so this is the idea behind the feedback thinking you can expand uh, you know the cause and effect relationships for any particular problem. Uh, what you see in front of you therefore describes that the same traffic congestion problem can be expanded to consider many other factors and therefore many other feedback systems uh, that are relevant for that particular problem uh, uh, situation or problematical situation. Uh, so the same theme uh, thinking related to feedback feedback thinking is illustrated here. This diagram is um, has evolved from the event thinking diagram that we saw earlier uh, in, in uh, slide number seven, uh, which focused on a linear thinking perspective. The same, same problem is now shown as if it was approached from a feedback thinking perspective, this is how it would be rendered, or this is how it would have been, it would be shown. Um, next, then, I want to focus specifically on uh, systems dynamics to illustrate this uh, feedback thinking process. And uh, what we need to recognize that, you know, systems dynamics, uh, uh, which was mostly, which, which was uh, developed by Jay Forrester from MIT, uh, focuses on a number of uh, steps. Uh, but before we discuss each of these steps in more detail, it is important to place the, you know, the modeling process of system dynamics um, uh, in context in terms of what, what does it, um, what does that process mean within a wider environment? Uh, because when you talk about modeling, uh, it is in, embedded in the dynamics of a particular system in the environment that you find uh, that system is in. Uh, we have talked about the idea of the environment at length. Uh, so what you see in front of you, uh, the borrowing from Sturman, um, uh, who is also based at MIT, where Jay Forrester was, uh, captures the, 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 the modeling process for systems dynamics, but placed within a wider context of systems thinking. So in the middle of this diagram, you see the various stages of systems thinking, uh, where the first stage is meant to focus on problem articulation. And, and in problem articulation, the emphasis is to delineate or to determine what is the boundary of the problem that you are looking at. And then uh, Sturman, stop, uh, Sturman talks about what is known as a dynamic hypothesis. So we have already seen what the meaning of uh, dynamic means uh, in contrast to what linear or static thinking is. So in the sec second stage now, we are bringing this idea of uh, dynamics to bear on uh, the, the modeling process. And hypothesis basically implies that you are making an assumption or a proposition about the behavior of that particular system. So when you make a hypothesis, it's basically a proposition or, 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 or an assumption about that, the behavior of the system. Now, uh, that dynamic hypothesis then leads you to formulate, or the stage of formulation, which requires that you not only consider the hypothesis, but uh, as you formulate the, uh, the structure of the problem, you need to rely on certain mental models about how that problem has exhibited itself before in the world. That's why if you see the broader circle, we talk about the, the real world. So meaning that from a systems perspective, some of the problems that we, we look at, there are various ways in which they have exhibited themselves before. 
This is the idea of mental models or systems archetypes uh, that was popularized by uh, you know, Peter Senge in 1990 in his book, The Fifth Discipline. And there are other systems thinkers such as Donella Meadows, Meadows who talked about systems archetypes. There are various types, uh, you know, I think as we speak now, there are about 12 of them and they are growing. That there are certain ways that the problems that we, so we try to solve in the world they have been exhibiting themselves in terms of their behavior, the structure of their behavior before we understand how they look like. And so those metal models help us in understanding the assumptions that we are making about those problems and how we then structure or formulate those problems in order to solve them. So following from uh, problem formulation and you can see how the mental models are coming in uh, we then need to uh, test uh, uh, what we have formulated and then determine policy from there and it's, it's shown as a cyclical process uh, so on the outer side where we have the real world uh, then you can see this information feedback this mental models of the real world uh, so mental models of the real world is uh, what, what we would call the systems archetypes uh, and, and, and you'd recall that this is this is part of the module one where we saw a number of systems archetypes uh, uh, you know for instance limits to success drif drifting goals etc uh, so those system archetypes uh, describe how certain problems uh, you know, generically have continued to ex exhibit themselves. So once we understand those uh, systems archetypes, they then inform how we not only, uh, uh, you know, formulate the problem, but even the hypothesis that we, we put forth as this is how the problem is exhibiting itself. Then testing and pop, uh, formula, uh, you know, policy formulation and evaluation is, is linked to how we determine strategy, the structure of the, that particular strategy and the decision rules that we use as, uh, you know, as we try to solve that particular problem. So according to uh, Sturman, uh, the modeling process then is uh, for systems dynamics is captured under these five particular steps. Uh, for, for this module, we'll focus on uh, step number one and number two, uh, where step number one is, is focused on problem articulation, and secondly, uh, dynamic hypothesis. Uh, but in the dynamic hypothesis, we will refer to the use of system archetypes to help us in understanding whatever systemic dilemma that we are looking at. So what you see next is uh, the same modeling procedure and on the right side we have also shown um, the same same aspects of it but trying to link it to mental models uh, in the manner that I've explained that mental models link to the systems archetypes that in terms of the problems that we try to solve uh, you know, every day. From a systems perspective, there, there, there are generate, generic ways that those problems have been approached before. So part of the modeling process is to try and understand uh, that particular problem or dilemma that you're looking at. Uh, are you able to link it to a particular, uh, you know, mental model or system archetype? So if you look at the diagram on the right, uh, you know, from the source Kavana and Mani, uh, it shows the mental models at the, at the bottom, which is sort of the broad base of it, that it shows that 
you can actually try and understand the problem that you're trying to solve uh, from that system archetype perspective. So the structures that you see in society, um, there are ways of understanding them which are based on those particular mental models. And, you know, uh, Peter Senge brought, brought it home by highlighting the importance of uh, mental, mental models or systems archetypes in uh, understanding or structuring the problems that we face every day. So the various systems archetypes are very useful in helping us to structure the dilemmas or the systemic problems that we face on a day-to-day -day, day -day basis. So let us look at the first two uh, stages of uh, systems dynamics uh, modeling. Um, I, I indicated that for this particular module, we focus on the first two stages of uh, systems dynamics modeling. And uh, for the first step, which is problem articulation, this is actually what is regarded as the most important step in, in modeling. And uh, from what is being projected, uh, what you see in front of you, there are a number of things that needs to be considered. Uh, the first one is when you talk about theme selection is what is actually the problem that you are focusing on and why is it a problem? Uh, so for this particular stage, uh, stage uh, the issue is to move beyond uh, the symptom of the problem and focus more on what is the purpose of this particular uh, uh, modeling exercise. So a clear purpose is very important in uh, actually going through the process of system dynamic modeling. In fact, <clears throat> uh, it is always important that when you consider what the purpose is, it's important not to focus on the system as a whole, but rather the problem that you want to be able to structure or understand. Uh, so the, the, the theme selection should therefore focus on, on that particular problem that you want to actually solve. So this normally requires that you focus on what are the key variables of the problem that you want to solve. Variables can also refer to what are the factors that influence or that affect that, that problem that you want to solve. So, um, you know, from a systems perspective, we normally talk about the dilemma. If it, if it is a digital divide dilemma, then the question would be to understand what the key variables would be. What are the factors that influence or cause the digital divide? So it forces you to start thinking about those issues that you actually see as impacting that dilemma that you are focused on. It's very, very important to be able to articulate clearly uh, what those variables are in terms of the factors that influence uh, that, that, that particular dilemma. And then secondly, is to be able to look at the time horizon. Uh, I'd indicated earlier that to understand uh, the dynamics of any situation, uh, time is of the essence because if you don't consider time, uh, then it would be a static issue and therefore much more oriented to linear thinking. And that's not what is being emphasized from a feedback uh, thinking perspective. So the time horizon then seeks to, to see how far in the future should this problem be considered and how far back 
should be looked at in order to understand the behavior of this system or the dilemma that you are looking at. So there, there are two aspects as, as indicated. Alpha in the future should be considered and how alpha back in the past lies the roots of that particular problem. So the time horizon should extend far enough back in history to show how the problem emerged and then describe its symptoms based on how it has, it has been emerging. So in a sense, the time elements uh, will start showing you the behavior of the dilemma over time. Uh, if you're talking about the digital divide problem, then we'll be looking at, you know, when did we really start talking about the internet and when did the internet start becoming part of how we do our things? Uh, so when the internet emerged, then uh, when did we start seeing that certain people were being left behind? as we started using the internet on a day-to-day -day basis. And therefore, what have we done about it? Because the digital divide simply implies that either the actions that we have taken, actions, uh, decisions that have been taken, uh, and or the policies that have been enacted to try and address it. Uh, but if it is still continuing, it means those actions in terms of the decisions or policies have not been effective. So when you are looking at how far back the digital divide problem has been exhibiting itself, uh, then it starts forcing you to look at, um, you know, the effectiveness of those decisions, structure of that problem that we are looking at. And so if we are still continuing in the same path, it means that the digital divide problem may extend further into the future. That's why we talk about not only the past in terms of the decisions that have been made about a particular dilemma, but how those decisions are likely to influence the trajectory or the path of the structure of that problem or dilemma. Uh, for instance, the digital divide into the future. So, in understanding the dynamics of any dilemma or any problem, the time horizon is therefore uh, critical. That's why, if you look at the third aspect in terms of the dynamic problem definition, therefore, is to, which is characterized as now capturing the reference model of that problem, is you are not only looking at the historical behavior of uh, the key concept of variables associated with that particular problem, but what might the behavior be in the future, um, considering some of the decisions that have been made. So the problem articulation, therefore, is based on those uh, you know, three major aspects, looking at what is the, the problem, that's the theme. Uh, what are the key variables? In other words, looking at the factors that um, are, are being seen to influence or affect the problem uh, as it is emerging. And what time horizon are you looking at? Time horizon also implies that, you know, different problems, uh, you know, when you look at the time horizon may relate to different time periods. So some problems uh, may, uh, may may occur in seconds in terms of looking at the time horizon. Some of them may occur within a day. Some of them may occur within hours uh, to understand its behavior. Some of them may occur, may be looked at in terms of weeks, months, years, or even decades. Uh, so the time horizon is very unique to that particular problem uh, that, that you are trying to understand or to structure uh, in the manner of, uh, uh, you know, a dynamic perspective. So what you see in this next slide is uh, 
an example of uh, a problem articulation. Uh, the example that I show you here is uh, linked to the, a province in South Africa, uh, KwaZulu-Natal or KZN. Uh, lately, um, in, in the month of April, um, you know, the province had floods and so there are many education was affected and there are many people who died during the floods and also, uh, you know, one of the, 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 the people who were affected or the sectors that was affected was education. And uh, at some point, there were over 600 schools that were closed because uh, students could not go to school uh, because the floods affected and destroyed school buildings and the roads were destroyed uh, and therefore the students could not go to school. The, you know, families also lost their incomes uh, because um, uh, the floods affected the businesses that they were working in or they could not even affect, uh, you know, access the businesses that they were working in. So uh, when you look at the, that problem, which is linked to that particular event, linked to the floods, uh, you know, the problem could be articulated in the manner that is shown. Uh, so how would the education officials in that particular province of South Africa react? Uh, and, and so the first part then basically describes uh, uh, the, the situation and also how the officials would have reacted. Uh, so it basically provides a narrative of what the problem is. That education officials from KZN, the province, uh, noticed an increased poor performance, also absenteeism, and school dropouts since the advent of floods uh, early in the year. And to date, over 600 schools remain closed due to destruction of school buildings, inaccessibility due to damage, damaged roads, and thousands of families have lost their livelihoods since businesses have been affected. Uh, so the Department of Education in the province uh, reacted by for instance, appointing tutors to address performance challenges, while mobile classes uh, were also started to address uh, the challenge of absenteeism, which was occasioned by the, the floods that affected the province in April of 2022. Uh, further, the government also increased subsidies to schools, uh, to address uneven fee incomes or revenues uh, as a result of low fee collection. So this that could describe uh, what the problem is uh, based on the crisis that was occasioned by the floods that happened in, in, uh, in April 2022. And from that problem, a number of things can be captured. As I've highlighted that, uh, any problem will capture a number of key variables or factors and um, uh, from what the uh, from the articulation of that problem uh, what is also noticed is some of the uh, quick fix solutions that were implemented by the department of education so uh, in terms of the factors uh, under performance that could be linked to uh, poor performance in, in schools as a result of the flights uh, because people are when students are not going to school uh, they're not they're not accessing their teachers therefore they are not able to um, uh, learn uh, so that obviously affects performance so performance becomes then a key variable of the problem absenteeism also as well and as well as dropouts as has been highlighted and, and some of the quick fix, which are very short term, reactionary, related to the event, uh, could be having or employing more tutors to offer tutorials to address the issue of performance. Uh, the province also reacted by having more uh, mobile classes 
and also to address issues of dropouts which is linked partly to the income of those families uh, you may find the government reacting by providing more subsidies or bursaries to to those schools so that they're able to support or they are able to mitigate against um, increased dropouts. So these are uh, quick reactions to a particular event. And so from um, an event-oriented thinking perspective, those would qualify as quick fixes. But from systems thinking, we know that those quick fixes uh, you know, are unlikely to solve the long-term problem that, that is associated with, a, a, you know, absenteeism, uh, performance, low performance or poor performance, or even increasing dropouts as uh, the environment changes, the business environment changes because of, uh, you know, the floods that occurred. So uh, a different way of thinking is, is required in order to address the unintended consequences of of the event that occurred. So from a problem articulation perspective, um, and when we link this to uh, the mental models that can be used to characterize or to understand problems, uh, this particular problem, the way it has been articulated with a quick fix, uh, you know, can be represented uh, using, uh, you know, one of the tools in systems dynamic modeling uh, called causal loop, causal loop diagrams, uh, but uh, aligning it to a particular mo mental model uh, related to, uh, you know, this issue of quick fixes, right? So in the next slide, yeah, you then see that we use aspects of these variables and the issue of quick fix to sort of show that particular problem, right? And uh, in this diagram, we are therefore showing and also linking it to the idea of uh, balancing feedback loops and reinforcing feed feedback loops. That if you think about the state of education given that crisis in that particular province, uh, then we know that uh, there will be poor performance or there is poor performance. And uh, from that reactionary perspective, then the government has, uh, you know, made a decision probably to increase more tutors or teachers and therefore more tutorials. And hopefully those tutorials are likely to uh, you know, to improve performance. That's why we have the positive polarity next to performance in this causal loop diagram. And if there is increased performance, uh, one likely effect is that performance uh, may result in reduced number of tutorials. It's a normal reaction uh, because if students start performing well in school, uh, then the schools may react by saying, okay, we don't need, you know, more tutorial sessions. Whether it is at schools or universities, it looks like the normal teaching can proceed without additional tutorials. Uh, once that is, 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 is a question of perception, once uh, there is improved performance, you know, um, uh, the, the reaction could be, it, we may not need more tutorials, right? It looks like the, the system has stabilized. That's why if you see this uh, feedback loop from performance to tutorials, it is indicating a reduction in number of tutorials. In other words, performance results in less tutorials. Uh, and that's why this first feedback loop, in terms of how the problem is being understood uh, from uh, what may be called fixes that fail from a systems architect perspective, it is showing that it is a negative polarity. 
That's why within this particular circle, uh, the feedback loop is indicated as a B. In other words, it's a balancing loop. Um, uh, it's a balancing loop feedback system, indicating that though there is, uh, because of that event, uh, by hiring more tutors, performance increased. But because of increased performance, there is always that perception that maybe we don't need more tutors to address this problem. This, this type of feedback system has also been seen in other sectors, whether you talk about health. I mean, during the COVID, during the COVID uh, uh, pandemic, uh, many hospitals in, for example, South Africa hired a lot of temporary nurses or medical personnel. Uh, but once that problem of uh, the pandemic started stabilizing in terms of reduced number of infections, the hospital started cutting down the budget and let go uh, those who are hired to perform the work. Uh, this is the, the meaning of this uh, negative feedback uh, polarity that you see here. Uh, that, that's the sort of the natural reaction once uh, some, some sort of um, uh, stabilization in terms of performance is noticed. So this uh, feedback system then is a balancing loop system where there's, uh, this causes an increase and then there is a reduction and therefore it has a balancing effect. So that's one aspect of how that problem can be understood in terms of how, for instance, the, the, uh, you know, the province is reacting to the education uh, crisis, uh, which has been occasioned by, uh, you know, the, the floods that occurred in April. But this also from feedback, from a feedback uh, a systems perspective, the unintended consequence is that because of uh, these tutorials um, improving performance, uh, attendance is likely to increase in schools or in those centers that are provided for uh, providing training or teaching. So that's why between performance and attendance, there is a positive polarity. In other words, performance is likely, and, and it can occur for even for a, an individual school. If there is high performance, you expect more enrollment in that particular, that particular school. So. Performance, therefore, uh, causes a reinforcing effect. In other words, this increment in, in, in the same direction. Uh, so attendance increases. And when attendance increases, uh, there's also a perceived need for more tutorials or more training. And that's why there's a, po a positive polarity uh, on this outer arrow that you see here. So this could be part of a rendering of that same problem uh, showing both uh, a balancing feedback loop as well as a reinforcing uh, a reinforcing uh, feedback uh, feedback loop so what we are demonstrating here is that when articulating uh, any dilemma uh, from a systems thinking perspective, um, you know, the systems archetypes are very useful in trying to understand that problem uh, that you are facing. Uh, and that's why, you know, those various systems archetypes, uh, whether we talk about fixes that fail. So if you look at this uh, problem, the way it has been artic articulated in front of you is based on uh, that, that aspect of system you know, fixes that fail. And the same problem could have been used at, could have been looked at using a different mental, mental model. Uh, for instance, limits to success, uh, you know, drifting goals, ETC. Uh, so uh, the, 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 the systems think I need to look at that particular dilemma and try and relate that dilemma to uh, the systems archetypes that are relevant for, for that particular problem. So from this problem articulation then, uh, the second stage then focuses on 
uh, formulating a dynamic hypothesis. Uh, partly what it implies here is that beyond looking at the dilemma, as you look at the dilemma, what are the other ways of how can this problem be solved? Again, uh, still using mental models to guide you in this particular process. Uh, so in step two, formulating a dynamic hypothesis, uh, which is where the focus of uh, the exercise that you're going to do is based on, is that once you have identified that problem and understood it in terms of the time horizon, then the, the systems thinker must begin to develop a theory, uh, which is what is called a dynamic hypothesis, to account for the problematic behavior that is being seen. Uh, and this theory or a dynamic hypothesis must be able to provide an explanation of the dynamics uh, characterizing the problem in terms of the underlying feedback uh, uh, and structure of the system. Uh, we say it is a hypothesis because it is provisional. In other words, it is subject to revision or can be abandoned as you learn from the modeling process and from the real world. And that's why Peter Senge talks about, or Peter Sen talks about organizations being learning organizations. So uh, systems dynamics then is a te technique of learning the problem uh, from a dynamic uh, perspective. So in the second stage, when we talk about the initial hypothesis generation, uh, we are focused on what are the current theories of the problematic behavior. When you talk about current theories, again, we are drawing on what is the relevant system's archetype or mental model that can help you in understanding the problem in a deeper manner as you start thinking about the solution to that particular problem. Uh, for you to be able to do that, uh, Jay Forrester, who came up with uh, this systems dynamics approach, uh, says that it is important to focus on uh, what are known as endogenous factors as opposed to exogenous factors. Endogenous factors focuses on internal factors that can help you to explain the behavior of the problem not of the system, the behavior of the problem. Uh, exogenous factors are external to the problem. The endogenous factors are internal to the problem and therefore under the control of the decision maker. Exogenous implies that, uh, you know, the factors that you are considering as exogenous or external are outside the control of the decision maker. So, uh, for Jay Forrester, in, in fact, he challenges uh, any systems thinker that if you look at any problematical situation, most of the factors that can be that are used to explain why it is behaving the way it is are, are actually internal rather than external, because uh, when you focus on the external factors is almost like you are shifting the blame. Yes, there will be external factors that, that are important for that problem, uh, but the, the bulk of the factors that can be used to understand or structure the problem are actually internal. In other words, so if you talk about a family, if a family has a problem, uh, you know, uh, the, the factors that are important for understanding the problem that affects that family. Uh, the focus should be, what are those internal factors? There would be external factors, yes, but the important factors are internal. If it is an organization, that is the same thing, in, uh, you know, from Jay Forrester's perspective. And, you know, the challenge 
uh, still remains up to now that uh, uh, what are those endogenous factors that are actually uh, can be used to explain why the problem is the way it is rather than uh, focusing on uh, you know exogenous or ex external factors so that is the import of that second uh, um, you know bullet talking about the, the systems dynamic modeling approach focuses on endogenous factors. So as you formulate a dynamic hypothesis, uh, you know, the, 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 the focus is on those endogenous consequences of the feedback structure. And that then allows you to use uh, a number of tools uh, to structure the problem, uh, whether they are what are known as model boundary diagrams, subsystem diagrams, coastal loop diagrams, token flow diagrams, policy structure diagrams, and other facilitation tools. Uh, in this particular module, uh, we will focus on the use of coastal loop diagrams uh, for, map, uh, for, for mapping the dynamic hypothesis. So what you see in this uh, next slide basically captures that, that, that aspect of uh, a greater focus on endogenous factors uh, as opposed to exogenous factors. And, and this is a model of, uh, you know, some of the factors that are used, that were used by uh, Sturman in, in 1983 to understand uh, uh, the energy economy and the various factors that play a role in how uh, the energy economy, um, the, the interactions within the energy economy. And if you see in this particular diagram, um, what you see is that there are more factors which are linked to, uh, you know, the endogenous aspect, aspects uh, in contrast to the exogenous aspects. And um, in terms of uh, what um, uh, Sturman calls the model boundary chart, uh, it should therefore be clear that you have more endogenous factors uh, compared to exogenous factors, and you can even go ahead and specify what are those factors that are ex excluded that actually do not affect the behavior of the problem uh, from uh, a systems uh, dynamics perspective. So this is uh, basically an illustration and an emphasis that uh, in looking at systems dynamic uh, dynamics modeling, when you see that you're focusing more on external factors or ex exogenous factors, then um, you, you miss the point in terms of understanding how the internal structure of the problem influences its behavior. Uh, that's why it is important to focus on endogenous factors uh, as opposed to exogenous factors. So in this next slide, I, I then use the same example of, you know, the, the, the problem situation, the educational crisis that happened in uh, this province in South Africa, KwaZulu-Natal, um, where, uh, uh, you know, floods caused disruption in education. And, and so obviously decision makers in that province and probably at national level uh, are much more concerned with how do we um, ensure that there is continuous good performance in terms of education, despite uh, the crisis that was occasioned by that event linked to uh, floods. And so following from uh, that thinking uh, that is emphasized by Jay Forrester in terms of focusing more on endogenous factors, uh, in contrast to exogenous factors. Uh, this is one uh, aspect of how to try and solve the problem 
uh, particularly if you approach the problem from a digital transformation perspective. In other words, uh, that particular province or county may consider that to solve this problem or to ensure that education continues uh, despite disruptions that were occasioned by the floods, um, you know, there may be need to set up an e-learning platform. And so then the, 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 the guiding question would be, uh, what are the factors that contribute to uh, educational performance uh, using an e-learning platform? So, so here we are now moving from uh, a problem to a policy issue or a decision. In other words, the, 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 the province wants to, is deciding or is, wants to come up with a policy that let's focus on e-learning as a way of ensuring there is always continuity in education uh, despite crises that may happen. And, and so, therefore, the factors must, must be linked to that policy decision. In other words, uh, factors that are linked to uh, realigning education towards an e-learning platform. Uh, uh, this is what is uh, being shown here. So from an endogenous perspective, there are a number of things that need to be considered, whether it is digital literacy of the teachers, the students, or the people who provide support in terms of education, uh, connectivity, uh, do we have teachers or trainers who are available uh, can we have learning hubs uh, so that uh, students who are cut off can have access to uh, centers where they can access the e-learning platform if they do not have uh, that capability at home? Do this, the, the schools have capacity? Uh, you know, is there power in terms of energy uh, so that because e-learning is based on providing uh, schooling using electricity and is the educational content available in that format that is uh, that is suitable for an e-learning platform? So th those could be some of the endogenous, uh, uh, you know, factors that need to be considered. And these are not the only factors. And, and this could be a particular worldview of that particular decision maker. Uh, it's just a sampling of uh, some of the endogenous factors that are relevant. In terms of exogenous factors could imply uh, how do we provide transport uh, to students to those learning hubs that need to be created because they may not have transport. Also, the economic status of their parents may have changed, so they may not be in a very good position to, to pay fees as required. So the government may need to come in in a certain way. And as e-learning platform becomes uh, very pervasive in terms of providing education, uh, does that particular society have the technology vendors to provide support ETC? So on, on one hand, we see endogenous factors and there are also exogenous factors, but there are also maybe factors that, yes, we know that they are important, uh, but they cannot fit in terms of how the solution is to be conceived. Like when we consider climate change, yes, we know that flooding may be um, as a result of climate change, uh, but how it fits into the e-learning e platform solution may not be clear. Uh, that's why it's captured as excluded uh, in line with, uh, you know, how Sturman looks at um, um, uh, how to consider endogenous, exogenous, and ex excluded, excluded factors uh, when you consider a problem and its solution from a systems dynamics modeling perspective. So this is an example uh, to give you uh, direction in terms of uh, when you think about any dilemma, for example, looking at uh, various uh, digital transformation dilemmas, how to think about the solution so in this case, the solution is uh, the e-learning platform, and that solution is to try and solve a particular problem which is related to educational formats. So uh, uh, 
we are linking educational performance uh, to the e-learning uh, platform as a, uh, as a digital solution. So following from this then, uh, in terms of the process of system dynamics uh, modeling, um, a causal loop diagram can then be uh, developed. Uh, as, as we have seen in the previous slide, uh, one, of, one of the techniques for mapping is the use of causal loop diagrams. Uh, I'll explain what it is. So this, for this particular problem, uh, how do we move from here to develop a causal loop uh, diagram using these endogenous um, factors and possibly considering exogenous factors. But for the purpose of this demonstration, the emphasis will be on how uh, these endogenous factors can play a role in developing a causal loop diagram. Uh, which would be useful for the exercise that you need to carry out. And so uh, remember uh, here, uh, in terms of a dynamic hypothesis, we, we are considering the use of an e-learning platform to try and solve that problem that is related to educational performance. So in terms of the, ex, uh, you know, uh, coming up with a causal loop diagram as part of formulating a dynamic hypothesis. Um, the thinking can be guided or should be guided by, you know, one of the mental models that, that analyze why an e-learning platform. And obviously, part of the reason why you develop that platform is so that you, you ensure there's continuity in terms of education, there's a continuity in terms of uh, student um, engagement, student enrollment, etc. So uh, such a solution can consider a mental model that not only considers, uh, you know, the need for growth. So you develop a digital platform so that you have, for instance, more customers. In this case, could be more students, in other words, sustained enrollment of students. So from a systems archetype perspective, it would imply considering, for instance, the use of that growth um, um, and underinvestment archetype. So growth will focus on that the solution needs to ensure the sustained enrollment but also emphasize that that archetype also focuses on underinvestment. So as you structure the problem, then your decision making will take into account uh, some of the limits that are associated with the growth situation. So when we talk about the growth and underinvestment archetype as a way of trying to structure uh, this uh, problem and solution based on the e-learning platform, the growth and investment situation uh, looks at what are some of the limits that could be eliminated or postponed if capacity related to investments uh, were made. Uh, so, what you see in front of you, therefore, is one way of structuring this problem by using the mental model, sorry, the, the mental model or the system archetype uh, called growth and underinvestment. And, you know, growth and investment has been linked to, uh, you know, a combination of another type of system archetype, which is uh, limits to success. So when you're developing a digital platform, uh, you must consider that, you know, you cannot grow exponentially. So as you plan the solution, 
uh, you need to look at that constraining aspect of uh, you know exponential growth uh, at the end of the day so this is uh, what is shown here and for this particular diagram uh, when we look at the polarities the S uh, focuses on a reinforcing uh, loop S so it would have been a positive sign so you may find various books using different polarities the O shows a balancing or, or, or a negative loop. So if you think about this particular problem uh, and you want to solve the issue of educational performance using an e-learning platform, then in other words, the policy decision is based on, you know, there are funds available to develop a digital learning platform. And once that is implemented, uh, then that is likely to result in increased enrollments. In other words, education will continue. The, the students will continue to, to be taught uh, using this digital platform. So by putting in place a digital platform, and I want to highlight that we have uh, simplified it here because there could have been a delay here, but the, 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 the aspect of delay has been captured elsewhere. Uh, but for demonstration purposes, it simply shows that from a policy perspective, when you make that decision, um, that is likely to result in increased enrollments when you put that digital platform in place. That's why we have this positive polarity here. And then when there is increased enrollments, uh, one of the reinforcing effects is increased revenues. Uh, uh, however, whether revenues refers to fees being paid or increased subsidies to schools, if there are more students in schools, maybe the government is giving those schools more money or giving the, uh, the provincial department more money in order to support those students, or uh, they actually the students are actually paying fees. That's why there is that reinforcing effect. We have an S here and an S here, here based on revenues. So this particular feedback structure that you see here is therefore captured as a reinforcing feedback loop system. Because when you put a digital platform in place, you expect more enrollments, more revenues from fees or subsidies, and therefore, those revenues uh, can be plugged in to enhance the digital platform uh, to, you know, to enhance the educational outcomes that is expected from an e-learning platform. That is one of the loops. However, there are, there are other aspects as well. When you have increased enrollments uh, and based on the aspects of limits to growth uh, with increased enrollments and if you have capacity constraints uh, for example it may take time to uh, either recruit teachers or train more teachers that who are able to uh, su support that particular environment there's a high likelihood that the quality of training may decrease in other words, there is more demand which has been brought about by the digital platform. So the quality of training may go down. That's why we have this arrow with an O, which is a balancing or a negative loop. So with the increased enrollments, then you expect the quality of training to go down. This also happens in, in other commercial sectors. I mean, if you are wildly successful in terms of uh, sales. Uh, what impact does that have on customer service? Customer service may deteriorate and, and therefore you start seeing much more customer complaints. Uh, so for this particular problem then this becomes a limiting factor or a constraining factor in terms of the growth that is expected uh, which is linked to uh, putting the digital platform in place. So quality of training is likely to go down 
um, uh, you know, uh, uh, this is this is the impact that is that that is really seen here um, uh, in terms of uh, quality of uh, uh, quality of training. All right, uh, and, and so this can have an impact in another uh, uh, feedback loop system down here. Uh, we uh, we get back to uh, you know in in a short while. So the other understanding that needs to be considered is this uh, a B2 loop. And it will appear counterintuitive because we have seen that if enrollments have increased, uh, the quality of training is likely to go up. You know, in other words, so, sorry, it's likely to go down. There are fewer teachers. And, and that's likely affecting the quality of training. But the other aspect of that is that um, we are looking at a higher number of students over a lower number of teachers. The impact of that is that the cost of training is actually lower. If the cost of training is lower, it has an intuitive uh, effect in terms of increasing the number of enro enrollments. Uh, so the input, uh, sort of an input-output scenario, because the cost of training is lower. So uh, this second B B two, which is a balancing uh, balancing loop, uh, you know, uh, focuses on the fact that the cost of training has gone down. If the cost of training is down, that is likely to have a positive effect on the number of enrollments. That's why we have this uh, uh, B2, which is a balancing loop. So on this arrow, yes, there is uh, that negative impact, but overall within this loop, um, the cost of training has gone down, that is likely to increase. If the cost goes down, it's likely to increase enrollments. That's why this is, uh, the S here is reinforcing, but the S and O for this particular feedback loop is therefore balancing because they cancel each other out for this particular, uh, for this particular loop. Uh, so, then if you move from here, then we have another loop, the B3, which has a number of, uh, uh, you know, uh, decisions. Uh, we, we, we now know that quality of training is down. Um, if quality of training is down, then there will obviously be a perceived need for more teachers to improve the quality of training. And also, uh, there may be another policy decision where the government is saying, no, we need to maintain a certain standard. So we have a service standard here, as captured here. And so the service standard is likely to impose uh, this uh, uh, positive polarity, the S. In other words, for us to maintain standards, let us hire more teachers. That's why there is this increased perceived need for more teachers, not only flowing from uh, this aspect, but also the service standard which is being imposed. So quality of uh, the low quality of training as a result of increased enrollment, um, you know, obviously has an opposite effect in terms of perceived need for more teachers, uh, uh, and also that effect based on the service standard. Uh, which then increases the need for more investment in learning hubs. That's why this is a positive polarity. But creating these uh, learning hubs uh, may take time. The learning hubs may also in involve putting up physical buildings, putting in infrastructure related to 
telecommunications infrastructure and other ICTs. Uh, that's why we introduce a component of delay here. Yes, it will have uh, a positive impact or a reinforcing impact on training capacity. In other words, improving the overall training capacity, but that delay is inherent in terms of the infrastructure that needs to be put in place for, for these learning hubs to be operational. But once those, once the training capacity has been established, that will have a positive impact on the quality of training. In other words, improving the quality of training. Uh, but also there's a recognition that there, there could be a delay component here. So this causal loop diagram of linking the e-learning platform to educational resources uh, does not just look at the digital planning basically improving enrollment you know, to ensure continuity of education, but also look, looks at other constraining factors that putting in place a digital platform uh, may have a constraining effect, uh, an unintended consequ uh, consequence, and, and th uh, th that constraining or limiting factor uh, will result in other considerations um, that, that has resulted in, for instance, looking at the service standard and how it influences the need for more teachers, the need for more investment in learning hubs, and uh, training capacity, ETC. So this uh, slide has demonstrated that you can move from articulation of the problem to look at uh, what the dynamic hypothesis is. As I have indicated, the hypothesis is a proposition for how that problem can be better looked at to see how it will behave in the future. And uh, following from this particular step, uh, and based on the availability of, uh, you know, data related to each of uh, the decisions that are being made, then a simulation can be performed to determine if the province goes on this e-learning platform, how do we expect, what impact do we expect that particular platform to have in terms of educational performance? Uh, that uh, that was uh, that was being studied from that particular event, in other words, the floods that were experienced. So this is one aspect of how to uh, you know to make an argument uh, based on causal loop diagramming, and sharing this causal loop diagram with other stakeholders to to try and understand the reasoning uh, related to uh, the decision to use digital platforms to solve the e-learning problem uh, based on these particular factors that have been taken into account. Uh, there may be many more factors that are involved. Uh, so this was an example to demonstrate, you know, how to formulate a dynamic hypothesis uh, by relying on a systems archetype to be able to map uh, the thinking uh, that the thinking behind uh, the problem and the solution that is being being considered. So the rest of the slides then look at the various uh, 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 steps involved. Uh, so step three focuses on how to formulate a simulation model, which is uh, beyond the scope of this module, can will be looked at in other in other modules. Um, testing uh, the solution. Uh, looking at the policy design and evaluation of, uh, uh, of the policy. All right, so the rest of the slides then explains the, the character of causal loop diagrams to understand uh, the nature of uh, reinforcing loops and balancing loops. Uh, and um, what is important is to understand that uh, to be able to determine uh, whether a, a feedback system is negative or positive, um, the focus is on one of the ways of determining that is to uh, is to uh, determine the number of negative polarities in a particular uh, loop. Right? So 
Remember that each causal link is assigned either a positive or a negative polarity to indicate, uh, for example, how the dependent variable changes when the, in, uh, in, uh, you know, the independent variable changes. Now, so just to summarize is that a positive link or a positive polarity means that if the cost increases, the, the, the effect increases above what it would otherwise have been. And if the cost decreases, the effect decreases below what it would otherwise have been. And that a negative link means that if the cost increases, the effect decreases below what it would otherwise have been. And if the cost decreases, uh, then the effect increases above what it would otherwise uh, would have been. So basically, uh, these link polarities that you see in causal loop diagrams describe the structure of the system which is the basis of uh, system dynamics modeling uh, to be able to determine the structure of a particular problem. Lastly, in order to determine uh, what makes a loop positive or negative, how do you determine that? Um, you know, there are basically two ways of doing this. Uh, one way is to reason your way uh, through the loop. In other words, determine whether it is uh, a reinforcing loop or a, ba a balancing loop. But uh, an easier way out is to count the number of negative links in the loop. So. The numerical way is basically to focus on how many negative loops are there, how many negative polarities are there in a loop. Uh, and so if the number of negative polarities is even or zero, then the loop is positive. In other words, it is a reinforcing loop. If the number of polarities, negative polarities is odd, then the loop is a positive um, or a, reinf uh, reinf a reinforcing um, feedback loop system. So from that numerical perspective, the focus is only on the negative polarities. Uh, most of the times uh, that, that, that approach works, Otherwise, for, for sometimes complex uh, causal loop di diagrams, uh, because of several interactions and links, um, it may not work. Therefore, it allows, it, it, it requires that you, uh, you know, for a systems thinker to actually reason their way out to find out what are the effects of these various interactions. Are they positive uh, or negative? So. Uh, the, the slide that you see in front of you tries to emphasize uh, how to determine uh, whether a feedback loop system is either positive or, or, or negative. So uh, the right way, therefore, is to be able to determine the polarity of a loop by tracing the effect of a small change in one of the variables as it propagates around the loop. So basically reasoning your way around the loop. Uh, so if the feedback effect is uh, reinforces the original change, it is a positive loop. If it opposes the original change, it is a negative loop. Otherwise, then um, it's basically to count, uh, first ways to count the number of negative links. As I've indicated, if the number of negative links is even, the loop is positive, uh, otherwise, if the number is odd, uh, then the loop is um, actually negative. So, in terms of expectations of, uh, uh, so the other example that is shown here, uh, a, a, proj a project, an example of one of the 
uh, projects that we are involved in where we used uh, systems dynamics modeling within the health sector in, in Uganda. And uh, what you see is a number of uh, reinforcing loops and also balancing balancing loop. So system dynamics modeling, what we need to remember can, also, can be used uh, even in qualitative aspects, but also uh, where there's quantitative information that can be used to, 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 to simulate the behavior of the structure of that problem that uh, you see, uh, the, 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 the structure of the problem that you are investigating. So I've given the source of this um, um, uh, diagram that you see in front of you. Uh, more information can be obtained from that particular article, which explains in detail the step-by-step -step procedure, how to go about doing systems dynamics uh, modeling, and how to go to the stage of even doing a simulation. And there are various simulation uh, programs that are available uh, to do systems dynamics modeling. Uh, for instance, Vensim and Insight Maker. Both Vensim and Insight Maker are available in a free form uh, format. Um, uh, uh, therefore, can uh, allow you to practice uh, by modeling any any particular problem to understand the structure of uh, the problem that you are looking at. So this is the example that is shown in front of you. Um, so to be able to simulate, then you have to go to uh, look at the concept of stocks and flows that uh, will not be looking at uh, stocks and flows in this particular module. Um, and, and so we'll end by looking at um, what value can decision makers uh, uh, get from using systems dynamics modeling. Uh, the summary you see in front of you is obtained from the prescribed textbook by Jackson, uh, focused on critical systems thinking and the management of complexity. And some of the things that uh, Jackson says is that, number one, it is often helpful to look beyond the apparent mess presented by surface appearances to see if there are any underlying patterns of feedback loops that are determining systems behavior. So when I started, uh, I indicated that at the surface, the surface is the level of events. Underlying those events could be patterns that are not obvious. Uh, so systems dynamic modeling uh, can allow us to understand those underlying patterns uh, in order to determine the structure of the problem that we are looking at. So an understanding of how feedback loops interact uh, to cause system behavior can therefore inform the way managers work. Uh, because uh, the events that we see is not everything. And therefore we need techniques to be able to go be, uh, you know, beyond the surface uh, to understand what are the patterns that uh, connect these various events that we are seeing. Uh, thus, when you talk about techniques such as machine learning uh, or data mining, they go beyond the surface to try and connect by using data to connect because data points to events that are seen. Uh, so the point, point number two is simply emphasizing that in like manner, systems dynamic modeling allows us to go beyond the surface. Uh, by using feedback thinking to see what uh, lies uh, beyond the surface. Uh, so rather than jumping to what appear to be obvious solutions to problems, uh, therefore managers need to appreciate that complex systems often behave in subtle and unexpected ways. Thus, system dynamics supports the conclusion that no man is an island. And by no man is an island, we are saying no event is actually an island on its own. It's connected to some other event. And if you connect that event to something else, a certain pattern will emerge, which will give you uh, uh, an insight into the behavior of the structure of that problem. 
therefore it is no good therefore just to blame the environment or other people for our problems and that's why Jay Forrester focuses on endogenous aspects that look at the internal structure of the problem the endogenous variables can it help you to understand the structure of that particular problem thus uh, system dynamic models uh, are very useful in assisting managers to appreciate the systemic relationships in which they are involved and to which their decisions contribute so hopefully uh, this uh, introduction to systems dynamics modeling uh, can incite you to look further to use systems dynamic modeling to understand uh, how uh, interrelationships from a systems perspective exhibit themselves to show you the behavior of, of uh, you know problems uh, when you consider time as a critical dimension of uh, that particular problem.